welcome everybody. It's so great to see people here and also hi to everybody who's joining us virtually. So just some announcements at the start. So please use the Swap Card um, app to submit, submit questions for speakers and view the up-to-date agenda. Um, and the hashtag for sharing on social media is hashtag EA Global. So I'm very excited now to be hosting the fireside chat with Will. So Will is an associate professor in philosophy at Oxford University. He's also a senior research fellow at the Global Priorities Institute. He's also the director of the Forethought Foundation for Global Priorities Research and co-founder and president of the Center for Effective Altruism. Will is the author of uh, the books Doing Good Better and Moral Uncertainty, and he has an upcoming book on long-termism called What We Owe the Future. Please join me in welcoming Will. <laughs> Him. Great. Um, so it's been two years since we've been able to come together as a community like this, so it's really great to be uh, with you here. Um, so what's been your main focus of the last two years? Has it primarily been the upcoming book? Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So um, I've been planning to do this book for maybe it's four years now. Mm -hmm. And then when we saw the kind of pandemic was going to hit, I just thought, OK, this is the perfect opportunity um, <laughs> to just cancel everything else that I'm doing yeah. and just really go very deep on this. And uh, that's exactly what I did, and that was 18 months ago, and uh, now I'm one month away from having the final draft sent off to production. Okay, wonderful. And then what would the publication date be? Publication is September next year. Sep so there's quite a long turnaround in the world of publishing. Okay. Um, is it as bad as academic publishing? No. No. <laughs> Marvel Uncertainty, when we sent them the manuscript, they just sat on it for the year and did nothing, and then wow. afterwards like, sent it like... It took, yeah, and I think it was like a full two years from the manuscript being done to actually being published. Okay, so if it, thankfully important. the world doesn't have to wait so long for this book. Yeah. Um, so now that you're mostly done with the book, uh, what have you most updated on over the course of writing it? Yeah, I mean, just an enormous amount, and so it might even be hard to distill it. Um, uh, so maybe I'll kind of give the structure of the book first, mm -hmm. because then when I talk about updates, it's like almost every chapter. Yeah. Um, so again, the first part of it just makes the case for uh, long-termism, um, where that's the idea that positively influencing the long-term future is a key moral priority of our time. I'm not arguing it's the most important priority, priority in the book. Um, and it also gives a framework for assessing um, events or things we could do in terms of their long-term importance, which I call the significance persistence contingency framework. It kind of embeds into the importance aspect of the importance, neglect, and distractibility framework. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are uh, four more parts. Um, the second part is about uh, values changes and the possibility of value lock-in. Uh, the th third part is on catastrophe, the possibility of extinction or unrecovered civilizational collapse. Um, the fourth part is philosophical issues that are relevant to the question of, do we want greater quality in the future? So making the future better conditional on survival? Or do we want more quantity? Do we want just the future to be as long as possible? such as by reducing the risk of extinction. And uh, the two issues there are population ethics and uh, the expected value of the future. Mm -hmm. And then the final part is just like, what can we do? Um, and in terms of kind of updates I've made along the way, uh, I feel like, yeah, I've updated quite a bit on the importance of values changes. Um, and that's for a bunch of reasons. So uh, one, I updated a lot on just the contingency of moral change. Mm -hmm. So um, in my third chapter, I focus a lot on the abolition of slavery, um, where prior to kind of knowing anything about this, I would have thought, um, you know, if there was any sort of non-contingent moral change, it would have been um, that slavery was abolished, had this idea of like, well, it's um, either it's just economic changes over time, or it's just this kind of march of moral progress. Mm -hmm. um, and I really don't think that's the case. I think um, uh, if history were to run a thousand times from you know, 0 AD or, even, or earlier, um, in a very significant proportion of um, the worlds where we've got this current level of technology, like 1% or more of the population are enslaved. Um, and part of that is just because like, slavery was so universal across time and place. Mm -hmm. So the idea that um, you know, there seems to have only ever been one abolitionist movement. Like there was, people say it like, saying that slavery was a model across time and place. But slavery was almost universal across all agricultural societies um, and was just like very widely accepted. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, when you just look at the story as well, the kind of economic explanation, I think, just doesn't check out. 
um, the kind of march, inevitable march of moral progress is maybe like an optimistic take. I've got like some credence in it, but uh, um, I don't put like all, all the kind of weight in that. It really looks like just um, some groups kind of had got convinced of a certain set of moral arguments and then like went and kind of imposed that on the world. Um, so that's kind of one big thing. Um, secondly, taking more seriously the idea that we could, uh, values could get locked in. Um, in particular via AI, that's really the key thing that means that values get locked in for the very, very long time. Um, and that could be just, so even if we solve the alignment problem, um, so it's kind of humans in control, mm -hmm. well that doesn't mean you've got good values controlling the future. Mm -hmm. um, it could be the values of a dictator, for example. Um, and then the kind of final thing on importance of values changes is just, there's this crucial question about like how good do you think the future is going to be? So you might have this kind of cosmic optimism view, which is that if we don't mess up over the next few centuries, then uh, we'll just kind of converge on the correct model view over time. Um, uh, I, that's not really my view. Mm -hmm. um, instead, I think like, if you think here's the best possible future we could have, like what's the future I expect us to have? And it's better than zero, um, but it's maybe like a thousandth of the way there or something. And so uh, reducing extinction risk gets us from like zero to one or something in expected value, yeah. but trajectory changes or um, could get us from like one to a thousand. So um, there's potentially a lot more upside there. Uh, man, I'm gonna end up talking like for the entire hour yeah. if I um, <laughs> keep going at this rate. Um, okay, other big updates. Um, I'll maybe just mention two more from the later stages of the book. Uh, and so these are both things where I think the importance is greater than say direct extinction risk from like man-made pathogens, which I think are big, is big. Mm -hmm. um, so one is technological stagnation. So uh, I find it quite plausible that um, tech progress um, is already slowing down a little bit, but more crucially over the next century, we just kind of run out of steam and then just plateau. Um, so I think there's fairly good economic arguments for thinking that's quite light, like reasonably plausible, more than 10%. Um, and then the worry is that there's this kind of time of perils where we have say, um, uh, yeah, ability to make very dangerous man-made pathogens, not the ability to defend against them, um, and that we kind of plateau such that we get stuck in that window. Mm -hmm. And then if we get stuck, then um, potentially we're there for hundreds of years, thousands of years. And that means that like, if you've got this annual risk of extinction and you're just stuck in that window for thousands of years, that tech stagnation is adding more extinction risk than the extinction risk you get if you've got like sustained technological progress that just kind of takes you through the um, time of perils. Mm -hmm. So I think this tech stagnation worry is like potentially a very big deal. Um, then the second one is... Uh, was that surprising to you that that was... Oh yeah, super yeah. surprising. Yeah, I was like, this was really not on my radar even like a year ago. Mm -hmm. Just like, I was kind of vaguely thinking about it, but um, yeah, the kind of quantitative importance of it, I think it was just, I had not appreciated. Um, and then the other one is uh, that I, this is even more recent, I've become like very worried about this is like depletion of fossil fuels. So mm -hmm. here the argument is like, uh, say extinction risk is kind of X percent per year. Um, what's the chance of a um, catastrophe that does fall short of killing everybody, but kills a sufficient number of people that we move back to pre-industrial technology? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's at least 10X, like it's much more likely for that to happen than for everyone to die. Um, then what's the chance of us recovering? Um, getting back to kind of modern levels of tech um, well, I'm actually pretty bullish on that. Um, I think maybe it's like 95% or something. Um, but then what's the probability of doing that if we've just used up the accessible fossil fuels, which we probably will do in the next 100 years? Then, you know, I would drop quite a lot. Like maybe that's only 80% or something, or maybe even less. Like you could easily argue about these numbers, but I think it's like certainly in the ballpark of like direct um, extinction risk too. Um, and the stuff we could be doing on, about that, like we could be buying coal mines and things and just leaving them there. Yeah, <laughs> one of the more unusual interventions, yeah. I'm totally serious about it, but uh, I mean, maybe we can do things that are more cost effective than yeah. just buying a coal mine, but um, mm -hmm. no, I mean, serious. So the North Antelope Rochelle coal mine in uh, Wyoming, it's the biggest coal mine in the world. You can get the coal just for the shovel. Um, it costs like $5 billion. That's enough coal to power the first 40 years of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so it's like really quite a big deal. And like, mm -hmm. we've got a lot of money now. Yeah. The sort of thing we can be, th <laughs> sort of thing we can be thinking about. Um, I thought you could like turn it into an amusement park as yeah. well. Like, <laughs> it's like Indiana Jones, like yeah, cold things. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, um, would that, I mean, would there be any kind of cli like sort of near-term climate impact? Enormous other benefits. Yeah. yeah, I now actually think of this as like, so one thing I was really interested in is like, what's the baseline long-termist intervention? Mm -hmm. What's the equivalent of kind of give directly, but for long-termism? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I now think that uh, investment in clean technology, um, so like renewables, um, alternative uh, fuel sources, is that baseline. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Well, one, like kind of give directly, it could absorb um, hundreds of billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just looks very good on a wide variety of perspectives. So one is it helps keep fossil fuels in the ground. And that's very good from this idea perspective of societal recovery after the collapse. Um, it's helpful for tech progress, so it's looking good from the kind of progress studies, worrying about tech progress. It's obviously good from climate change perspective, mm -hmm. um, and it also has major near-term benefits as well, where air pollution kills millions of people every year. Um, you've also got this problem of energy poverty. Um, and it's also something which is just very tractable, like, you know, if people were like, okay, I'm going to spend hundreds of billions of this, like, we, j we just could. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen enormous successes so, um, in the past as well where Germany alone um, was responsible for you know, a very significant chunk, reason why solar has dropped so precipitously in cost over the past um, 10, 20 years. That was because of kind of, essentially kind of green activism within Germany that then led to um, enormous investments in subsidizing of solar panels, mm -hmm. which doesn't make any sense for Germany. It's like a kind of cloudy um, northern country. Yeah. It was enormously beneficial for the world as a whole because it caused solar uh, prices to drop so much. Mm -hmm. And what, yeah, what interventions would fall under that bucket? Mm -hmm. So tons of stuff. So yeah, um, R and D is the kind of key thing. And so solar and wind, we know most about. Mm -hmm. um, also fusion um, is, you know, people always talk about it. It's like endlessly on the horizon, but I think it's like more plausibly here than, you know, the coming decades. And really hasn't had nearly as much R and D into it as it ought to have done, given that it's like unlimited. Um, potentially like, you know, super cheap um, energy resource. There's other kind of moonshots in terms of um, uh, clean energy. So like um, enhanced geothermal, super hot geothermal. The idea is to just dig a hole, but like really deep yeah. um, and then pour water in and then gas um, steam comes out and you can power the turbine. Mm -hmm. Very, very little research into that. But again, if we had that, if it worked, like the problem is just the drilling technology. Mm -hmm. um, if we had that, then you would have um, clean almost limitless power, like anywhere, not accessible anywhere in the world. Um, but then there's tons of stuff that's uh, like electric. So in terms of like decarbonizing the entire world, um, electricity is kind of the easiest bit. Mm -hmm. um, but there's lots of uses of um, fossil fuels that are, yeah, you can, it's not that easy to electrify. So like to make steel, you just need very high temperatures. Um, for shipping, for planes, you need some like very energy dense fuel. Um, and so there's big questions about, um, yeah, like alternative fuel sources. So like, can you use hydrogen? Can you use ammonia, methanol, things like that um, in place? And so there's this very wide range of things that you want to be funding in clean tech. Yeah. I mean, so you've obviously sort of done a deep dive on climate <laughs> for this book. I, I, does, has that made you kind of more or less worried about climate than before you started? Uh, yeah, it was a real roller coaster journey. Mm. Like I kind of almost want to write it up as a example of a deliberation ladder where it's something like you start off with the mainstream media and you're like, oh, this is like so bad. And then you read the economic models and it's like, okay, even the like stern review, which is meant to be like the really alarmist view just says it's like, 5% drop in GDP by 2100. Mm -hmm. But from people who are kind of four times richer than they are today, this is just like, doesn't seem that bad. And then you look into the models and you realize the models are complete junk and like you should put no weight in them at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then like you realize other things that like the main metric for warming, which is equilibrium climate sensitivity is not measuring the thing you want. Mm -hmm. Cause that assumes like warming increases and then just stays there. Like the sorry, CO2 just stays there in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, it gets absorbed. Um, and then you also realize like CO2 stays in the atmosphere for like tens of thousands of years, whereas almost all the analysis is in like next hundred years. So potentially it's missing out 99% of the badness, yep. um, let alone like climate, like tail risks. Um, and so, yeah, it was just like massive kind of bouncing all over the place. Um, at one point I was much more concerned about climate change. Um, and the key worry I had, which I was, a kind of scenario that I just thought had not had nearly enough attention was the risk that we just failed to fully decarbonize the economy. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's still, you know, energy demand increases massively, which we should expect it to over the coming century, couple of centuries. AI is far away and other, like other preemption things are far away. But it's still like, we've got a kind of, there's still this big chunk of carbon usage, which if you just look over coming centuries, not just to 2100, but beyond that, you end up burning through almost all the fossil fuels we can. Um, at one point, it looked like that would lead to kind of 16 degrees of warming or something. And that looks really bad. Yeah. And that's not like, oh, maybe our models are wrong. It's like, no, what, that's what we would predict to happen. And it seemed to me that wasn't being, attention wasn't being paid to that just because the horizons on like long-term planning are to like 2100, they're very yeah. short. Um, that worst case kind of scenario is now looking like much less likely. So John Halstead and Johannes Eck have a post about this. Mm -hmm. um, and partly that's just like climate activism means that the governments in the world are like taking this really seriously. Um, partly it means uh, because of solar and wind becoming so much cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, and then partly also uh, just there's this crucial question. So there's like how many fossil fuels are in the world? The, it's called the resources. Mm -hmm. And then there's like what are the reserves, which are like what is economically feasible to, um, to use. So if we use all resources, that's looking really bad. That's like 20 degrees of warming or something. Um, uh, I don't know the exact figure. But it looks now that like almost all of that like won't be economically feasible because mm -hmm. it's almost all coal and we're just moving off coal anyway, basically. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's kind of been this mad thing. And now I'm like, I guess maybe I'm back to where I started on climate change or something. <laughs> and now I'm like, um, now the main thing is actually just keeping fossil fuels in the ground being yeah. the most important consideration. Um, I mean, the climate effects, to be clear, are like really bad. We should get like, we should just totally decarbonize the economy. It's like a kind of slam dunk. Um, but from a long termist perspective, I think like the most crucial thing is just ensuring that we've not used up this potentially essential um, mm -hmm. uh, non-renewable resource in case we need to do the whole kind of industrial just industrialization thing again. So. OK, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm assuming you've come across in the process of research for your book many like, weird and wonderful facts. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the weirdest and most wonderful? Yeah, I got. Um, because I was writing this book during lockdown, so you go completely mad. Yeah. <laughs> At one point, I got really into potatoes. And, yeah. um, uh, and one draft of the book had loads of potato stuff on potatoes, and it all had to go, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but the potato was a really big deal. It was like one of the most important technologies of all time. Um, I mean, this could uh, be a forum post, right? And I kind of, it's really funny. Like, I told myself in order to, um, uh, you know, come to terms with the fact that I was going to have to ditch all this content because it wasn't really relevant. <laughs> um, I was like, okay, maybe I'll just like on my spare time write an article about it at some point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so according to one econometric study, and maybe you can question like how reliable it is, um, the, where the potato was introduced when it got, so it was domesticated in the Andes, brought to the new world. Um, originally, it was like uh, very, you know, people were very suspicious of it. It was very unusual. They thought it would give you leprosy because it looked like leprous skin. <laughs> um, people, and it was like, and it's in the nightshade family, so uh, mm -hmm. people thought it might poison you. Uh, but anyway, it was gra kind of gradually um, taken up. And those areas that were suitable for potato-based agriculture um, urbanized much more rapidly and grew in population much more rapidly. Mm -hmm. And if you just extrapolate from this one study, um, if it weren't for the potato, there would be a billion fewer people alive today. Um, and uh, it, why was it so good? Well, it allowed you to produce three times as many calories for a given acre of land. It was also recursively self-improving because um, you could farm potatoes, feed them to agriculture that would produce, uh, f feed them to livestock that would produce manure mm -hmm. that would significantly increase how many potatoes you could grow. <laughs> and it's also very close to a superfood. So um, though the potato is much maligned today, yeah. <laughs> um, it contains many more nutrients than um, other crops like rice or other equivalents. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually, as long as you occasionally supplement with a bit of oats or lentils, you could live forever on buttery mashed potatoes. So, yeah. Great. Um, did you put that into practice at any point? <laughs> um, I did eat more potatoes. As yeah. Result. Yeah, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. Great. Um, and I guess this is, this is now your third book. Um, mm -hmm. does, does writing books get easier? Yeah, I mean, this book has been intrinsically much, much harder than doing it better, especially. Mm. Um, well, just 
I set myself like a very ambitious aims with it where long-termism is an intrinsically harder thing to write about than you know, um, uh, global health and development. But then at the same time, like with doing good better, we'd already had many years of you know, conveying these ideas in a compelling way. And the kind of, it was clear like, okay, these are the kind of conclusions, the upshots, and it was just presenting it. Mm -hmm. Whereas with long-termism, I didn't even feel like I really knew what I was happy like saying and conveying. So yeah. there's like a res big research project there. And then also I was like, there's been much less work in terms of presenting these ideas in a more um, kind of engaging way. Um, and so I like had to do the kind of research or actually effort on that. Mm. And then finally trying to have an aim of a book that could be both widely cited in academia, but also engaging um, was just like enormous amount of work as well. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, I did think it got, yeah, the writing got easier where you just get more used to things like getting words on a page, more used to get receiving like brutal feedback and like hating yourself <laughs> for a while. You're like, that's yeah. all part of it, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, and then a huge thing for me compared to doing good better was just, I could narrow the line, like we just, I could narrow the line this like quite extensive research team. Mm. So, um, you know, it's now in the final run up, it's not just me, it's like five other people working full time um, on the book. Um, that kind of number varied a bit over time, but like I always had like at least several research systems. And then also we could just ask um, anyone in the world, like, yeah. <laughs> and say, hey, we can pay you like a decent amount, like salary as a contractor um, in order to help um, ensure that the text is accurate, like I can talk to you. And that's just like enormously helpful in terms of quickly getting up to speed with something. Mm -hmm. And that was, yeah, really transformative. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how many like person hours or months or years has collectively gone into writing the book? Yeah, my guess, even just on the explicit writing, yeah, somewhere, my guess would be somewhere between 10 and 20 or something. Years? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's better be good. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no pressure. No pressure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, what do you hope people take away from reading? The, I mean, obviously, it's going to be it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you hope people take away from reading the book? So, what kind of action do you hope people take? Yeah, terrific. I mean, um, yeah, the key thing to convey is just this argument for thinking. Oh, we should really be taking seriously you know, this vast future that we potentially have in front of us and the fact that things that we, you know, do in our lifetimes could help steer that into, onto a better trajectory. Um, and then, you know, the conclusion is just um, very humble in terms of what we know at the moment. Like, I lead the conclusion with this so that I'm other people, um, people in the Andes and the way... So when we talk about time, we say, like, the future's ahead of us and the past's behind. For them, it's different. So mm -hmm. the future's behind them and the past is ahead. And that's because of, uh, you know, you can see the present and you can see the past. We know that. Mm -hmm. Whereas the future um, is unknown to us. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got to, like, infer what it's like. And I use that to kind of emphasize just how little we still know about um, how to uh, make the longer term go better. Um, and so I kind of say, I kind of have three kind of broad lessons. Um, so one is like doing things that are robustly good. So do I think investment in clean tech um, is just going to be good for the long term? And I'm like, yeah, I feel really confident about that. Mm -hmm. I think there's a bunch of stuff in like bio risk as well. It's just like, okay, and other disaster preparedness and stuff. I'm just feeling like very confident that's good. Um, so like first is do the robustly good options. I've got examples there. Um, secondly is just like learn more. Um, so again, that can be in your own life, but in the world as a whole. Um, I really feel like the kind of level, like long-termism is very much in its infancy mm -hmm. in terms of what we know. Um, uh, you know, I already, I'm sure, gave the impression like my views have changed a lot even in the last year. Mm. Um, I expect with further research over the coming years, it's gonna change a lot again. Um, so there's just enormous value in kind of building up uh, our understanding of, of the strategic landscape. Um, and then finally is kind of build, keep, have more options open to you. So um, in the case of AI, for example, um, you know, you read blog posts by Holden Karnofsky, Luke Malhauser, and they're like, yeah, on the object level, we don't really know what we're doing at the moment. We don't know even what's good or bad. Um, 
uh, there's a lot of sign uncertainty. Um, so what we're really doing is kind of building up capacity such that when we have more strategic clarity, we can take more action. And perhaps building the kind of movement of effective altruism or people engaged with long-termism is also like a crucial thing to do there. Mm -hmm. Great. And if we fast forward to this fireside chat, so this time next year we're sat yeah. here, uh, what would have happened to make your book kind of a huge success in your eyes? Yeah. Um, so what I count as a you know, like huge success, um, the bar there would be kind of uh, appearing on bestsellers lists, mm -hmm. um, selling like a million copies is kind of vain. Mm -hmm. um, no idea whether we'll manage that. Books are very fat tailed. So um, most just kind of flop. Uh, how would we get there? Um, I mean, a big thing is like, just getting buzz from kind of, you know, the big names, thinkers, intellectuals, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, having, you know, example, someone I don't know, you well, Noah Harari or something, reviewing it would be like a really big win. Yeah. Um, another big thing, like seeing as I'm in this room, is like grassroots as well, where um, in terms of, you know, say getting on bestsellers lists, just having loads of people who in the week before, like pre-orders or the week of, um, just kind of, going out and buying books for yourself and for all your friends and family mm -hmm. like really makes a kind of big difference yeah. so that's going to be my one little pitch um, yeah. <laughs> um uh that's the sort of thing that would really help yeah okay fantastic so in, in um ben todd's talk earlier he mentioned that he was really excited about potentially having a kind of updated doing good better yeah. because um you know having more more up-to-date introductory text would be great um is you know could that be your next book yeah so i'm going to be as of december after the manuscript's in, I'm going to be thinking a lot about what my next plan should be. Mm -hmm. um, I am pretty uh, open to the idea of there being a revised doing better. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't know, how I'm currently seeing it is unlikely I'd, co I'd single author it, but I could put potentially co author it. Yeah. Um, there's one person I talked to briefly about this. Um, I think Ben and I have like slightly different views on what that doing good better to, but doing good better to, the t like, Reboot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The return of the good. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Amanda once had this very funny, like, list of mm -hmm. um, like effective altruism-oriented books. Yeah. Which is like Nick Cooney's is being great at doing good. <laughs> Mine is like doing good better. Seeing as is the most good you can do. And then <laughs> the sequel is obviously like more good than is possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so maybe you should like that. Uh, yeah, Ben's kind of vision was. Uh, something that's more like really starting with cause prioritization, kind of more kind of uh, in like this kind of like intellectual framework. Um, I think if I was, yeah, the thing that I'd be more excited about in terms of a doing a better sequel would be something that's just more about the community actually, mm -hmm. and maybe and like represents the ideas and like the sorts of things people wrestle with, like but via kind of stories of people in there being like, oh, I, like this is how I think about how much I give, or like. Mm -hmm. um, this is how I think about, um, you know, which cause to select and so on. Um, but that's kind of very open. So, yeah, it's a possibility there. So. Exciting. Um, so, I guess, wrapping up conversation, I mean, is there anything else you'd like to say on, on the book? Uh, um, I guess maybe one thing is, like, I'd be really excited about more people, um, mm. like, writing books. I feel like in, you know, this conference, um, in you know Trajan House where we work in um, Oxford, there's just this enormous kind of ideas overhang, mm. and you go to places which are like you know TED conference or something. It's got kind of desperate for ideas, um, and no, I think it's really true. Like it's amazing. Like mm -hmm. I don't know, like Tim Urban or something, who's kind of coming from outside. He really thinks that well, it's now Trajan House was Little Gate House. He's like, oh, this is like the epicenter of like interesting ideas, um, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're like interesting ideas in this kind of like, you know, tech long-term vein, especially. Um, and I also think that this kind of path of writing a book and then having the TED talk and like doing talks and being like mm -hmm. a figure um, is much easier to achieve than it might look mm -hmm. because people aren't really trying for it most of the time. Like, it's not like you can, it's not like there's a path. Yeah. So, well, what do you do? You're either an academic, but then you're, all your incentives are not towards this, mm -hmm. or you kind of aim to be a writer directly, but then it's just very hard to make any money. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, again, that's just not something that, um, you know, is necessarily like a, a limiting factor for us. And so, um, yeah, I have, again, on this kind of long list of things I'd love to see is like kind of public intellectual kind of boot camp. We've just got loads of people who are getting 
grants to then, you know, they just take some particular topic, write a book on it, and then can have like, um, you know, talks around the, the TED talk around it or whatever, and mm -hmm. documentaries or something too. And hopefully we'll have lots of learnings from your book and Toby's book. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Great. So um, moving on from the book, um, what are you most excited about in the field of global priorities research right now, seeing as you kind of uh, are kind of a key figure at two of the main G GPR organizations? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited by lots of different areas. So one is kind of global priorities research in fields where it's kind of neglected. Mm -hmm. So um, psychology, I think, could grow a lot. Um, so I've already been talking to some psychologists here, and um, yeah, there are some plans to and grow that field because there's just a remarkable number of people within psychology who are like, oh yeah, these ideas just make a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just stuff. Yeah, there's just like over time of come to the view there's more important research in psychology mm -hmm. that I would like love to see. So for the book, I've got this chapter in the value of the future. One question I just wanted to know is like, of human beings alive today, what proportion have lives that are above zero versus below zero? Mm -hmm. And there's almost no relevant research to that. Um, even though it's, even forget about long-termism stuff, just like short the short term, like how much should we care about saving lives versus benefiting lives? Mm -hmm. um, health economists use the quality metric, but the worst, the worst state you can be in, not even the worst life, but the worst state you can be in is zero, is death. Mm. But it's like, look, we know that people can go below that. Um, and that can be a really big deal because um, it can mean that improving the quality of life can become comparatively more important than saving life. But there's almost no work on that. There's this one draft study, um, which I talk about a lot. Um, and I've commissioned Lucius to do um, a bit more work on it. Um, like run another study, which is just asking people like, it's got, I guess it's pretty dark, but like just mm -hmm. asking people in both US and India, um, if you could choose to have never been born, like would you choose that? Mm -hmm. And like a few different versions of that question. That's just one example. There's many other things in psychology that I'm really excited about. Um, a second, another field where I'd love to see more is history as well. Mm -hmm. um, where just at the moment, how many EA historians do we have? And it's like one and a half or something. Like yeah. it's really very few. And it just like, the means the low hanging fruit just hasn't been plucked like at all. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking about trying to influence the long term, okay, well, one thing you can do is sit as an armchair and like draw up models about how AI is going to go and so on. Um, and that's like, you know, that's of some value. Another thing that's of some value is like understanding how long term historical processes have gone. Mm -hmm. um, and what do you think the low hanging fruit are in history? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a big thing is on. Well, yeah, so the thing I started off on was like what things are contingent and what thing mm -hmm. what things have been very persistent and so there you get um, I think like information. Yeah, there's tons. So what has been very persistent and so information and then kind of relatedly um, How many people have tried to have an influence over the very long term and have they been successful? So now I think I've identified to my knowledge the earliest successful long-termist which is Thucydides um, writing about 500 BC. So he's got this history of the Peloponnesian War. Um, and in the book, he says, I've deliberately not written this book to just be like entertaining for the next few years. I've analyzed the scenario, which is the war between Sparta and um, Athens, uh, in order to draw out general truths, which human nature being what they are, will be relevant for you know, many, many generations to come. This book is written for, to be like, mm -hmm. this book is written to last forever. And the book is still taught in West Point and um, other military academies. Like the Thucydides' analysis of the, um, the reason why Sparta and Athens went to war is like the basis of Graham Allison's book, Destined for War, mm -hmm. which we have copies, of, like was published in 2007, no, 2017. Um, and there's like copies floating around the, um, uh, um, yeah, floating around this conference. Um, and so that's an example of like, okay, you look to the past, what things have been very persistent? And you see it's like, okay, information, like values have been very persistent, mm. so religions are extremely persistent. Um, and some differences, like why is India um, a third vegetarian and other cultures um, uh, have almost no vegetarians? It's like, okay, that goes back thousands of years. Yeah. Um, institutions like seem somewhat persistent, but comparatively less, like they've got, you can think of kind of different entities as like having intrinsic different half-lives. Um, and then companies are like surprisingly non-persistent, so companies, have a half-life of about 10 years. It's like really short, actually. Mm -hmm. Even really big companies. Um, and so that's kind of, 
it gives just one argument, not the only argument, because things are very different now for thinking, OK, maybe it's like the value stuff that's most persistent. Don't, you know, companies, maybe the effects can be persistent, but the company itself will probably die. So that's one bit of low hanging fruit. Another is contingency, in particular model contingency, um, where, yeah, it was very non obvious to me before learning about it, like how much is kind of economic determinism through, where you've just got the kind of march of technological progress and people's model views kind of follow from that. I feel like, you know, techie people, which like I would include myself under that or something, like mm -hmm. are most naturally drawn to that. Um, I think it's just very not true. Um, I think if anything, like the causation often goes the other way. Like, why was there industrial revolution in, um, you know, Britain, Northwestern Europe? I think that's because of values. Actually, I think it's a culture. Like, there's a cultural change that then precipitates that, rather than, um, and then there's this feedback loop. But rather than like, oh, we invented the steam engine, then everything else changes. What's the steel man of uh, tech progress equals moral, leads to moral progress? Um, I mean, one steel man would be, yeah, there's one model you could have, which is like tech progress leads to, has led in the last 250 years to higher incomes per capita, mm -hmm. and perhaps morality is just like this luxury good. So mm -hmm. here's this thing I don't believe. Um, but you could believe, which is like, people's model views are kind of basically the same, but when you're very poor, you just don't want to do thing, like good things modally. Um, well, not you don't want to do good things modally, but like, you're not going to be donating like large chunks of your income to mm -hmm. help people in distant countries and so on. You're not going to be as worried about helping animals and things. But when you get richer, then the, you, know, you can get less benefit to yourself from spending money, and whereas you can get the same amount of benefit to others from... Um, kind of doing good things modally, and so you're more willing to kind of pay those um, those costs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that has like, yeah, I think it has something going. I think that's like part of the story. But I think the underlying thing that like everyone's kind of the same modally, like, is just like very wrong. So mm -hmm. nice. So you've outlined this like some of the kind of projects you might be excited to see in GPR. Um, I guess more broadly, what what kind of like. Uh, organizations or institutes or projects would you be excited to see in the yeah. long-termist community more generally? Um, yeah, actually on GPR, that was just, oh. <laughs> again, again, that was like yeah. a small part of what I was, um, everything I could say. But So there's new fields is one thing. And then um, there's, I guess I'll just highlight one other thing, which is like, mm -hmm. there's this certain sort of work, which is like, they're like, not just interdisciplinary, but like, let's call it like pan-disciplinary. Mm -hmm. um, and extremely just motivated by kind of you know going for the throat in terms of what what is the most important like what are the most important kind of crucial considerations mm -hmm. that just doesn't naturally fit within academia at all. So the go-to example I use is normally what would it take to cause the collapse of civilization? Mm -hmm. um, how likely are we to recover from that? Under what conditions are we likely to recover? Like if we've used up the fossil fuels, what if climate change is greater? Mm -hmm. um, what if there's like a greater disease burden? Um, and then what can we do to like ensure that recovery is more likely? That's just like, there's no field for that. Mm -hmm. um, certainly not within academia. And like what the skills you need, it's like you're drawing on like common sense reasoning and like maybe it's like a bit of stats here and there like there's some economic studies that can be useful just tons of like random bits of like empirical data there's so yeah there's no like home for that but it's like enormously important like can be hugely influential and can be i think like very directly hugely influential for the rest of the community mm -hmm. so there's just kind of this like very messy i just want to figure out the world and like the key long-termist priorities and very few people are really doing it too. So, but it seems like something that I don't know. As a community, we have the skills to do. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, very exactly. good absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's actually yeah a kind of the assuring thing that like, um, you don't need like super mega math talent or something mm -hmm. or like, um, the biggest predictor is just like, are you really going for like the key questions? I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, cool. and then I guess a, a similar question, but not just for GPR for kind of long termist causes in general. Okay, yeah, so you were saying, yeah, what um, other projects would I like to see in long-termism? Mm -hmm. So yeah, on this theme of kind of mega oh, rocket ships, um, so yeah, I was saying mega projects, and then people were complaining that's like the Flyberg, you know, you think of these big bureaucracies like building a new dam or nuclear power station, and they Yeah, they over overrun. budget, over, yeah. So I'm trying to use rocket ships instead, but I don't know if it'll catch on. Yeah. Catch on. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... 
there's a whole bunch. So I think I've been thinking in my own case a lot about just trying to overtake kind of leapfrog kind of academia. Mm -hmm. So potentially setting up um, uh, like an independent research institute, maybe aiming to just be a university mm -hmm. um, where, so the thought is like Finson Institute for Advanced Study is not part of Finson University, but it has similar levels of prestige, gets similar quality of people. Perhaps we could do that. So we have like the Oxford Institute for Long-Term Thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and you could make a big splash. You could have a billion dollar endowment. Um, you could kind of buy in as consultants and advisors like Nobel, you know, various Nobel laureates and so on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, perhaps we could just purchase journals, um, try and make like academic journal publishing better. You could potentially offer jobs that are just like far or like more desirable than um, uh, you know traditional academic jobs. You don't have to like go through the labor of like PhD, tenure stack, and so on, mm -hmm. um, uh, and just get you know extremely talented researchers trying to just find nothing but the truth on the most important questions. Um, where again, the outputs of that are like might be very different from typical academic articles. Where um, again, academia is not like it's. It's a set of incentives is kind of correlated with the truth, but not perfectly, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's kind of, yeah, one thing is just, yeah, having a new university. Um, I'm extremely interested in talent search. So um, there are just hundreds of thousands of people around the world who are like extremely bright, like naturally gifted, um, altruistically motivated. They would like, like to make the world a better place if they can. Mm -hmm. You know, conscientious, could do enormously good things but they're born into the rural India or something. They've just like never got a chance. Um, can we just find those people and then like um, help them in terms of giving them education, financial resources and so on, such that they can like, are like free of that and actually can, um, you know, contribute in a really meaningful way to the world. Mm -hmm. Again, this seems good from like a number of perspectives. Um, you know, it's good for them. <laughs> um, uh, it's good for the, the, like the home countries, um, but then also from, you know, we have all of these problems. We need more people working on them. Mm -hmm. Like, perhaps we can just set up a kind of um, a system for doing that. Uh, and I've been talking with some people about this um, particular idea. Uh, I'd also be keen, yeah, on a lot more. So I understand that BT has tons of stuff on big bio projects. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know as much about them. Um, I'm also really keen on, yeah, more disaster preparedness work. So yeah. buying coal mines, I'm like totally serious on, um, or other things for leaving coal in the ground, um, and maybe and hopefully other fossil fuels too. Um, but then also just other things for like, if there's a um, <clears throat> collapse of civilization, you know, can we like really rebound and like in a good way? Mm -hmm. um, so at the most extreme, you might have a like hermetically sealed bunker that no pathogens can enter into. But full of potatoes. Full of potatoes. <laughs> just potatoes and butter. Yeah. And everyone's gonna have a great time, yeah. Um, uh, but then also things that are just like, even if not everyone has kind of died off, just you know, you could imagine these kind of uh, aircraft hangars that just have like, you know, tools and technology that are going to be like very um, mm -hmm. uh, helpful. So, and some of it's quite non-obvious. So apparently just getting like the thread on a screw, it took like centuries to develop because mm -hmm. it's like, get, you need to have the right periodicity and that's just, you need to have a kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know the technical term. Basically you need to have that in order to make it. Mm -hmm. And so it's like very hard to kind of get to. Um, but yeah, things like that to just ensure that like, yeah, if there's some sort of civil collapse, we can, you know, really bounce back. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's just like, yeah, enormous amounts um, we can potentially do there. Um, and then another category of things I think is like EA media. So, mm. um, you know, if you have a documentary that's funded at like $10 million, that's like the top documentaries, among the top most well-funded documentaries in the world. Um, I think we could do that for like, you know, I think we could have many of them like per year. Um, uh, I think like movies as well. So um, Armageddon and Deep Impact were certainly helpful for um, uh, the NASA Space Guard program that was used to detect um, existing asteroids. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt Contagion, like you might not know, was um, funded by Participant Media, which uh, is a social enterprise. It's like deliberately funding um, socially impactful movies. Uh, and Matt Hancock is like, oh yeah, watch that film Contagion. That's how I know vaccines work or something. <laughs> it's like, um, so it's like actually, ha you know, really does have an influence. Yeah. Similarly, fiction, both the Cobra event on bioterrorism and uh, Ghost Fleet on lethal autonomous weapons, 
were, um, I think, apparently very influential in the US government. Um, I actually think the Terminator was like an enormously good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I know that like AI researchers hate it, but yeah. I think the fact that like, you know, you've got the person in the suite and it's like, oh, we're worried about AI. They're like, oh, I know how this goes. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, I think this is actually very, like, very helpful. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's something that we could like, I don't know, a lot of the ideas that get talked about in these circles like could make for very good movies. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, I think could help like kind of make a lot of these like seemingly abstract ideas like much more concrete. Yeah. And I guess it's also nice because it is, that's a kind of slightly, diff feels like a slightly different skill set to one that we like mm -hmm. have in the community so we can be more open to a broader range of people or yeah, for sure. backgrounds. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, so what do you think, um, looking back at the kind of past year or so, are some of the community's biggest successes? Yeah. So I mentioned this briefly in the opening talk last night. I mean, it is hard to not say like the success of FTX being like enormous. Um, uh, and so that's just a really big thing. I do think this making real inroads in policy is really not what I've been focused on or working on, mm -hmm. um, but was, I would have said, you know, a few years ago, it's like, wow, this is just such, so ne like neglected by EA. And it's like, we had made like, I think very few inroads. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, yeah, we've got the kind of sector, UN Secretary General reports, like mm -hmm. perhaps like, you know, long-termism can be a kind of unifying framework for the UN in the way that sustainable development goals were, and millennium development goals 20 years ago. Um, uh, yeah, this like Apollo program influence in the Biden administration as well is just mm. like very cool. It's like very large scale as well. Um, similarly at the OECD, they have a foresight team. Um, of course, you're involved um, with helping that get going. Um, where again, like, yeah, this kind of like long-term views just getting taken like very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, some of the work of like Center for Long-Term Resilience as well, it's just been like really crushing it in terms of getting these ideas like really taken up. Um, that's been something that's, yeah, I think been very um, impressive as well. Yeah, and then on the kind of flip side, what do you think we might have, we might have done better on in the last year as a community? Yeah, I think the thing that most leaps out to me is my our response to COVID actually. Mm -hmm. So like, we were extremely, I don't know, I think like, yeah, if there's one kind of line of criticism I can imagine of the EA community, mm -hmm. um, it's like, oh, with a bunch of like theorists rather than action oriented people. Mm -hmm. And so, and I do think this played out with COVID where we just knew it was like, we were just like very far sighted in terms of, compared to the rest of the world in terms of, um, well, firstly being worried about pandemics in advance, mm -hmm. secondly, just, even as early as January, being like, oh, this is gonna be a really big deal. But then like, what did we really do? Um, I mean, like in my own case, like I think that like, because, yeah, I think like I could have taken actions that at least an expectation would have saved like hundreds of thousands of lives in like the UK mm -hmm. by like, you know, people I knew in government being like, this is a really big deal as of February. Yeah. I kind of wasn't. And it's like, it's interesting why not, where it's like, oh, well, yeah, these arguments seem to make sense, but I guess that's a bit weird. Like the other, you know, the establishment mm -hmm. <laughs> authorities like World Health Organization and so on don't seem to think it's a bigger deal. So I guess maybe I'm confused or something, mm -hmm. but it's not kind of a mode of just like, oh, I'm gonna just really take these arguments seriously. If I'm not convinced, then it's like, no, I'm gonna actually try and like immediately have an impact. Yeah. Um, similarly, I think if you look at uh, like the organizations that funded, I mean, this is all impressionistic. It's not something I've dug into. I think it would be really good as like a case study. Um, and I think some people are looking into this. But like the organizations that we had funded, like um, that were giving kind of policy advice, it's not clear they were really helpful. I think some of them were saying the like standard establishment things like mass, you know, against masks early on and like different, um, not such strong, you know, not the like actually kind of rational actions that we should have been promoting. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you look at, say, um, the FAST grants program from Tyler Cohen and Patrick Collison, mm -hmm. like, so they were slower to realize that it was a big thing. So, you know, we were doing better at predicting, but then they just immediately spent like $50 million yeah. giving like quick grants to the searchers, um, which seemed to have a really big impact. Like there was, um, I've forgotten the name of the antidepressant that, um, 
helps reduce the impact of um, the negative impact of COVID mm -hmm. flu or the mean of pox or mean or something. Yeah. Um, you know, it was their funding that was like helped speed that along um, kind of much faster. And so, yeah, there is this kind of line of criticism that especially people who are in the more like kind of entrepreneur world could make of like the existing EA community as it is, which is like good at thinking, not that good at acting. Mm -hmm. And like, even if I think, I don't know, that's like un a bit uncharitable, I think there's like something there. So. Yeah. Um, and then I guess we've been, we've sort of spoken a fair bit about content on the kind of documentary side, but generally what kind of content would you be excited to see the e-community producing in the next year or so? Oh, terrific. Um, yeah, it's a great question. <coughs> so in terms of, yeah, I would love, yeah, I mean, there's kind of content and like media. So yeah, I would love there to be more EA documentaries, um, EA films, YouTube um, could also be great. Mm -hmm. Like we don't do videos that much, but um, We've got one TikTok star, that's about it. Well, exactly, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah big up Ben for my... Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and then in terms of content, um, I would love to just, I don't know, there's lots of these like little ideas, or, like parts of the overall worldview that I think we could really push on. So um, one is like just population ethics. Um, it's just, you know, I've got one chapter on it. It's like, it's all kind of mind blowing. Mm -hmm. I think there could just be a book on like, both the kind of intrinsic and instrumental reasons there, like should we have more kids? Um, uh, I think it's just like a really important question. Um, I think, yes, like for each of the different cause areas, I think again, there could just be like a book on that. So yeah. um, I'd love this to see there be more content and like updated worries about AI, where there's like flurry of kind of books on the classic AI risk argument kind of bosh them so the, the argument that's most associated with Nick bosh them and super intelligence is also human compatible life 3.0 mm -hmm. um, I thought the alignment problem was an by Brian Christian was an excellent kind of generalization of that mm -hmm. um, I think there could definitely be more there in terms of like the latest and how people are thinking about AI um, I think yeah books on disaster preparedness also could be just um, yeah, exceptionally good as well. So. Are you excited about things like op-eds and like sort of more journalisty media? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I am kind of in general, like my experience, I've had kind of more mixed experience with op-eds mm -hmm. and I think it's because you get just much shallower engagement. So mm -hmm. in general, I really tend to favor kind of, yeah, high depth, high engagement mm -hmm. um, media. So. Um, podcasts, of course, mm -hmm. um, and books, and then documentaries would count too. Um, and why is that? It's like you can convey a much more nuanced message. Um, I think like the changes that we're suggesting people make, like these really big changes in the world. Mm -hmm. And if I think about intellectual influences over me, I can't really think of articles that I've read and it's like, oh, that just changed my life. Mm -hmm. Whereas I can think of many books like that. Yeah. And it's partly just like a weight thing. Like even if it's the same message, yeah. but I don't know, you're reading it over the course of weeks or something. And so you keep getting it and really think about it. Um, and then there's also lots of stuff in the media. It's just like, it's very noisy and messy. And it's like, people are fighting and shouting a lot. And mm -hmm. like, um, I find that like both counterproductive, but also like a bit annoying. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's like tons of scope for really high quality journalism. Kelsey Piper at Vox um, mm -hmm. in particular is just like, I just think, yeah, her work is just astonishing. It's like really good. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's something where I've still not figured it out though. Like how, I guess like the key thing is like, how do you do traditional media op-eds in a way that's like getting the value you want to get out of it? And that might just be like my like personal tastes and failings or something. Cool, and then um, got time for one last question. So how do you expect to spend your time over the next year, two years? It's a great question. So the first thing is really, so I'm, yeah. Well, I might take some holiday. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm like planning to, but then I'm like, oh, there's all these other things I want to do. Yeah. Um, I probably should. Um, the main thing is actually figuring out like, what am I going to do next? So um, there's kind of various options of, 
one is just continuing like quite hard and the kind of writing like public engagement sort of stuff. Um, a second would be, uh, yeah, maybe trying to set up one of these rocket ships. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps the, you know, uh, perhaps it's the university idea. That's mm -hmm. the thing that's kind of most on my mind, but who knows, next month maybe it's something different. Yeah. Um, or it could be a more like meta kind of coordination role, perhaps. I'm like not particularly engaged with any one of them, but like mm -hmm. make, trying to help make sure that the community as a whole is like, has its resources allocated as well as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, as of uh, December, um, I'm going to start thinking more seriously about which of these paths should I take. Um, it'll still be the case that at least half my time of the next year will be on the kind of promotion and yeah, mm -hmm. publicity in the book and so on. Um, so there'll be a big kind of swell of PR in about September. Okay, and you'll do like a world book tour? Or? Yeah, I think I'm more, especially given like, you know, s you know, there was not much travel happening the last year and a half. And it does make me more inclined to do that. So um, I'll certainly be in London and New York and San Francisco. Um, and then I kind of want to go to Korea. So like with Doing Good Better, um, the, it sold more copies in South Korea than in any other country. And I'm like, what's going on there? I still don't really know. Is it co yeah, cold-hearted altruism? Is that the transition? Yeah. <laughs> so, OK, the publishers, this is why, I don't know, this is a good anecdote about like, how tough it is, like the world of media that's like very a model actually. Mm -hmm. So um, I get a publishing, yeah, I get a publishing deal in South Korea, and they come back to me and say, okay, well, doing good better doesn't really make any sense in Korean, so it's going to be some other title. We'd think, okay, it should be effective altruist the title, mm -hmm. um, but effective doesn't quite like, so it's going to be objective altruist. Mm -hmm. I'm like, sure, sounds fine. Then, like, I guess it was the last of these conferences, so maybe two years ago, it was um, uh, Korean. Um, yeah, was here, and she said, oh, do you know how your book is t translated? And I was like, oh, it's objective altruist. She's like, no, it's cold-hearted altruist. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe that's why it sold so well. Like, I don't know, maybe I'm like <laughs> evil in career or something. Like. Um, and then I don't even know, like, does that have the same connotations of kind of psychopathy or like being a cold-blooded killer as yeah. like um, it does here? So anyway, I'd like to go and kind of figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then, yeah, I'd love to do more promotion in India, um, uh, in particular. Um, I've had these standing invites to go to Australia for many, many years, and I still feel bad that I've not gone yet. So, yeah, um, yeah I might just take this as an opportunity to visit a lot of places that I've yeah. hoped to visit um, in the past but haven't been able to. Wonderful. And I guess if you had uh, a message for people at the conference or something that you kind of want to uh, encourage, what would, it, what would it be? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll just lean into the thing that you've heard a bunch, which is just, yeah, being ambitious. So um, thinking about how, uh, yeah, what are the really big things you could do with your life and how could you be a part of that? Where, I don't know, there's been a lot of focus on like co-founding projects, but that's not necessarily, you know, the only thing. Um, could be also just like being an early employee at such a project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, could be trying to find more people who can um, be part of the community. Um, could be trying to aim high in like, you know, government policy too. So. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Thanks. Will. Will you please join me in thanking Will? Thank you.